Hello and good morning. You're welcome to the Marketing Attribution Untangled webinar with Bionic. Myself, Ronan Turner, I'm the Client Strategy Director in Bionic. I'm joined today uh, by CEO and Attribution Evangelist Brendan Hughes. Hi, Ronan. Brendan. Hi. Uh, and David Gutierrez, uh, who is the Head of Client Success for Bionic. Hello, Ronan. Hello to everyone there. In an ever tightening market, the spends get more refined. The big areas of investment are in data management and, and predictive marketing. And there's a huge importance on how, in real time, we can adjust and pivot our marketing strategies to deliver results. It's becoming an increasing challenge for clients as, we, as the wall gardens of the big platforms get reinforced. So marketing managers' attention is being pulled left and right to decipher the various reports in order to be able to assign the budgets to the right channels. So I suppose I, I'll go to... Uh, Brendan, first, just uh, how important is this single view of the, their campaign and, and what areas should they be focusing on the campaign in real time, how they can the shift budget to meet these goals? Yeah, um, so I think the big the big challenge really is at the end of the month, you know, when you're you're sitting down as the, the marketing director in front of the your you know, the board or the CEO or the CFO and you're, um, you know, across your different channels, you're spending lots of money and you're seeing lots of numbers in terms of what you're achieving. Um, but it's very difficult to tie that data back to um, to the actual sales or conversions that you achieved in a month. And this is kind of where the pain point really kind of flows. And then, you know, then the question is, how do you use that data? How What kind of decision making are you making uh, on the back of that data that is not even reliable at a very high level? Mm -hmm. And and if you, yeah, I mean that kind of backs it up because we looked at some of the stats uh, from a recent survey in 2018, and we noticed that like over half of marketers have a challenge when it comes to integrating the different systems uh, into their marketing plan and strategy, and that's frustrating for them. And also that you know over half of them, or just about under half of them, have a problem attributing then the revenue to these channels at various points within the sales funnel. And that obviously increases their frustration. So. I suppose if we have a look at that uh, in terms of how does one go about deciding on a measurement of performance of campaign and how to evaluate these, you might take me through a few of this. Yeah, so so look here in, in Bionic, um, we use you know what we call a kind of a marketing measurement hierarchy, which is either you know a measure of kind of the the I guess the maturity of how you're measuring what you're doing in your marketing or how you evolve kind of within your company. So you know at a very simplest level. Um, how we typically buy digital marketing is, you know, based on cost per impression or cost per click. Um, and essentially, we're, we're looking at reach, you know, how much of the desired audience are we getting? Maybe we get into things nowadays like viewability and um, and trust, et cetera, in terms of kind of understanding that and, and understanding that we're getting better value for money on that. Um, but it's all relatively limited in terms of what it actually, how useful that information is. Uh, if you go maybe one more step, then you're talking about looking at kind of ROI, return on investment, or return on ad spend. So, so, and what what kinds of things are we measuring here? So, we're measuring, um, you know, what's the brand lift? You know, how many conversions, how many sales, how much revenue have I achieved? Um, so for every one pound or one dollar that I'm spending, um, how much revenue kind of am I generating on the back of that? And again, that's great at a very high level, um, in terms of justifying kind of what's what, what you're doing um but in terms of informing kind of day-to-day -day decisions maybe it's not that useful so over the last i guess 10 15 years um you know we've, we've started to hang our hats on um what we would call rules-based kind of attribution which is yeah. you know looking at um either the first thing that somebody did um the first ad that they saw or the first platform where they saw an ad um, on the path to purchase or maybe the last thing that they did or um, and then you get into different models such as when maybe the first and the last doesn't make sense you get it's time decay and and all of these are if you like pretty arbitrary um, in terms of rules that have just evolved kind of over time so really where, 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 where the industry has moved on to now in the last few years is into what you might call rational or more holistic so you're taking um, evidence-based um, uh, decision making right at, at, at each I suppose with each period of the funnel so in real time is that, is that... well yeah and I guess how frequently you do it is, is is a separate question but it's it's more um you know you're looking at the funnels you're looking at the paths to purchase you're looking at the sequence of kind of, of events that lead to a sale um, and the critical thing is it's data driven and you're using that data um however 
regularly and frequently you can in order to um, to, to to change um, your, your ad strategies and your campaign strategies. Okay, all right, that's very interesting. It's great, um, and that that kind of brings me on because this is the, this is coming back to that point, to me, which is the the challenge uh, and I mentioned earlier on about these walled gardens. Um, the, the, some of the platforms, and that, that brings again that challenge for marketeers because they how can they break down these wall gardens and get a true transparent view of the campaigns and and how much are they really affecting ca- clients? Be, because we're aware that they're there, but how how do they affect clients? David, you might take uh, take us through a little bit of that one just to paint the background for us. Yes, of course, Roland. So let's say nowadays most companies will be utilizing vast majority of the channels that they have available to promote either their company, their products, their solutions. Uh, we've just highlighted here probably some of the most common ones you will find in the market, such as Facebook, Google, Amazon. Um, problem with this is they all have different ways of attribution. They're all valid, they're mm-hmm. all very good, but when we talk about Facebook, we're talking about person-to-person marketing, we're talking about the pixel, the events. When we talk about Google, we're looking into the cookies. Mm-hmm. which sometimes don't really translate depending on the journey of the customer path uh, is following. Then we might be talking about Amazon, which is at user level. Okay. So then we're still losing the data that comes before Amazon on it. And nowadays, if you look at the data separately, they're all doing marvelously. Like on the example you can see below, you can see that Facebook could have to do with, for example, 100 purchases, Google another 100, Amazon another 100, and so on. But at the end of the day, if you actually look at the conversions that your company achieved at the end of that month, you would see that there is a very high discrepancy between those levels. Right. Okay. So that's, that's a huge frustration then for clients, uh, for you know, marketeers when they're looking at their campaigns because they they're really blind as it comes to if they look only in this say in the Facebook world, they could say, right, I've done a hundred conversions, um, but then when they try to decipher that and, and break it down, they look at their final results at the end of the day, they're only got three hundred, whereas if they accounted for all of the touch points and use their reports, they're seeing 500 conversions. So there's a massive discrepancy there. Exactly. And the challenge there obviously is who do you attribute those 300 to if you don't have those signals, if you don't really understand how did that happen? Yeah. Okay. I know that, that, that makes perfect sense. So, so this leads me on nicely, I suppose, to, to, the, to what I find quite interesting in terms of how we go about, um, you know, deciding on, on which method to use when, when we're tracking these journeys. I mean, I know that common practice, uh, certainly for the last decade that I've been in digital media, uh, has always been, or in most cases, last click, which is uh, frustrating, especially for uh, publishers that will be operating in the higher end of the funnel, uh, more of the awareness side and less of the uh, the, the last click. So, Brendan, you might just talk us yeah. through some of the methodologies. I, I think if, we, if you take that, um, you know, let's say, you're buying your new Bose kind of headphones and, you know, let's imagine there's a scenario where there's a customer's a, a path to purchase, which maybe started on Facebook and maybe there was a click on, on Google and maybe, you know, watching a bit of an Instagram story and um, somebody ended up on Amazon, um, you know, you know, a couple of times maybe doing a review and got targeted with an Amazon ads and then maybe end up on Facebook and finally clicked on a link on Google before, before purchasing, um, you know, um, and you're right, so, you know, I, th- I think the most common kind of way that people today, I think maybe over 60% of people are still using last interaction, last click, last touch attribution. And in this scenario, you're saying actually, you know, the only thing that matters here, so 100% of the credit for that sale and that, and that this data point will inform my future strategies is going to be um, the last thing they did, which was click on an ad in Google. I use the analogy, you know, you wake up at a hangover, you had six pints or six drinks the night before, you know, are you saying then if you just have that last tequila shot, you know, just one tequila shot tomorrow night, then you're going to kind of wake up with a hangover the next morning as well, you know? Um, and of course it doesn't make sense, right? But there's lots of history as to why we have such a model. Um, and I think you can, you know, you can rattle through the different models and first interaction, you know, um, a lot of people hang their hats on this one and say, well, actually, if it wasn't for the very first thing mm-hmm. um, in, at the top of my funnel, um, then I, none of the other things would have mattered. I wouldn't have been able to reprospect it or remarket to them. So actually, that's the most important thing, and maybe the only thing that matters. Yeah. Um, more balanced approach might be this what we can call positional or U-shaped or the first and last, which is maybe typically you give forty percent the credit to the first thing and forty percent the credit to the last thing, and then you spread the rest and um, between the other the other touch points. Again, relatively arbitrary um, mm-hmm. in terms of where, where where that data might come from. Um, another approach is to you know what's called linear or even, and what this will do is 
it'll just weight everything equally. Right? Okay. Um, Give them all an equal share. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. but actually, it doesn't kind of give any account to the fact that actually, you know what, that um, the sixty second product explainer video that they watched, you know, through an Instagram or through a through a YouTube kind of ad campaign, that act that actually was the thing where they engaged for longer, um, and actually after that everything. Was, was was easy and that was the thing that drove so 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 makes no differentiation between the relative importance of the different channels um, and time to gay is, is one other kind of popular one which is sometimes it's used for very short sales cycles and sometimes it's used for much longer sales cycles so there's no real kind of rationale but what it does is as you can see and um, the things that happen most frequently kind of receive most credit um, but to be honest most of the industry is moving um towards kind of more data-driven models and um uh, and these will be you know algorithmic or they will be machine learning and what they do is they they look at the probability um that a particular touch point you know um uh, has an has a, a significant impact um, or makes a contribution to to a conversion so um one that's very common it's used in for example in campaign manager um is the shapely algorithm which is kind of econometrics which says look you know what let's let's model if we take out for example instagram out of the out of out of the the, the sequence yeah. how many fewer conversions would we get right okay and then it gives a weighting and a scoring to that so what you're seeing is um, more and more um, uh, marketers are moving away from these kind of static rules based into these kinds of algorithmic kind of um, data-driven um, uh, attribution models. And okay, we, just to add on top of that, yeah. Brendan, um, why I believe this is very important nowadays and understanding the different models is very relevant is because in the past, you would be looking at conversions that happened uniquely with one touch point, whether it's Facebook, it's Google, it's Amazon, but people didn't have the uh, available information in all the channels and there was not as many uh, companies promoting in all of them. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, from the data that I know, there's not more than a 5% of the conversion that happened through a unique channel. And even those still have repetitive connections within that channel. Right. For example, okay. three times they look in Google just to find the right product, the right website. Um, this is why understanding this path, understanding this journey is so important nowadays. Okay, that's very good. Thank you, thank you, David. So I suppose if we take this one step further, and then uh, you know you have a look at those those channels because we've we've talked about them already. How, how important they are, and depending on how you break down uh, and what model you use, but we know that these channels are important. Um, but how can they go about assigning budget then? And how, that, that's a huge challenge. So they, how do they go about deci deciding where to put the budget? I suppose if they're looking back at campaigns now, they're going. They have to go look, use the look back window, and they go right. You know, thirty days ago, but it's it's all in the past. Uh, and how much of an impact can that make? Yeah, um, I, I'll pick that up, Ronan. Maybe so. I think in this example that we we talked through now, there's a little bit of maths here. But um, you know, let's say at the end of um, you know, let's say an initial kind of I don't know seven day period, um, you know, you've actually delivered within your business, you know, two hundred and eighty conversions um, between all of the kind of digital marketing activities. Now, of course, if you add up, as David mentioned earlier, you know, the individual sales that the different channels are taking credit from, from let's say it's social, it's search and display and video in this case, um, then you know you always get a much bigger number, right? So, so, so how does how does this happen, and and how do how does um, using this data, um, you know, and again, a, better, a proper cross-platform view, how does that help you improve performance and efficiency of your campaign? So let's take an example where, and it doesn't, it could be, it could be, we're just picking Facebook here, it could be um, Search or it could be any any individual channel. Um, so at the end of the first period, um, Facebook, you know, sees that it, it, it generated or was responsible for 200 conversions. And imagine you had a scenario where you had two ad sets in your campaign. Why do um, the world? Two ads. Well, <laughs> yeah, and we come on. That's another webinar. But um, you know, and ad set A delivered, you know, uh, 110, and ad set kind of B delivered 90 conversions. You know, and you had an initial budget set up of, you know, you split your budget evenly of 100 dollars, kind of for the period, um, and therefore, you know, you can work out what your CPA is, right? So, what you might do, um, and um, what actually Facebook increasingly with its campaign budget optimization tool will do is will shift more budget over time into ad set A because clearly it's performing better, getting you more volume and a lower CPA. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, okay, good, right. Um, now, if you look at the exact same campaign and same period, but you look at it from that cross-platform perspective, and so depending on, on what, you know, looking at a data-driven attribution model, it doesn't matter. Um, and Facebook has actually been given credit um, for uh, contributing to 110 conversions. Um, 
uh, search 120 and let's say display in video 50. Um, and uh, and of course Facebook was involved in, in 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 more, but in terms of actually being given kind of a weighting and a credit. And the other thing that you'll typically see is actually it's a different ad set. Um, that's driving those 110 um, or, or a different proportion of the conversions. Right. And, and why might this be the case? Well, if you take in this case, ad set B here um, is, is given credit for 80. So ad set B is probably further down the funnel. It's probably could be a dynamic product ad. It could have an urgency built into it. It could have a call to action, mm -hmm. could have a special offer. So it's more likely to drive um, and take more responsibility for, for the conversions. Ad set A, on the other hand, might be much more top of funnel. Um, so it's it's doing some work, but yeah. actually it's not driving conversions according to the attribution model that you've set out. So, you know, after the same period, so remember the same budget was spent across, but actually the true CPA, so from a cross-platform perspective, is quite different now. So right. you end up with 333 versus 125. Okay. So what, what you would want to do then from a, let's say if you're from a cross-platform optimization point of view, it would be to actually, I want more of my budget um, to be made available for ad set B. Mm -hmm. And I want to win the auction. So I'm going to bid higher to kind of win the auction for ad right. set B. Um, so you're not, you're not talking about pulling budgets out of different platforms essentially, but more or less it's just refining the ad sets within the platforms to optimize yeah. to the best possible creative for yeah. the overall campaign. Yeah, and I, so, so I think at this level, the way we're talking about, no, you're not. Yeah. Um, but if you take it to the next level, then what, what as a marketer you want to be able to do is to dynamically adjust the budget between even the platforms. Right. So why, why, you know, you why do you care, you know, yeah, exactly, um, no. uh, which ad in which platform um, gets most budget, um, so long as it's the one that's more likely to drive my goals. Okay. So if we look at this, it can maybe campaign. Look what what happens after. Let's say after another week, and you've you've shifted budget, um, and if you take the the budget reallocation that comes out of the box within a platform such as Facebook. Then remember, it was shifting budget over time into ad set A because yeah. it thought that was the most performant one. Um, but if you look at our, and if we look at this campaign now, not from the wall garden perspective, but from the cross platform perspective, um, then the the CPA you know was much greater. So for your 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 budget of 180, um, you know you're operating a much higher CPA. So you're going to get you know, and the maths will work out. You get 70 conversions, right? And um, now, if you look at the same, and imagine you had taken a different strategy, and you'd actually shifted the budget over time, and uh, you won't do it all in one go, but over time you'd shift budget increasingly to ad set B. Um, and remember, the true CPA there was 125 versus a 333. So now, all of a sudden, you have um, a much greater capability to drive more conversions um, from the same budget. Right, okay, on, the, on the individual channels. On the individual channels. Right, yeah, yeah. okay. So, um, and that can be a radical shift, and I know, and um, David, maybe we'll jump in, but we, you know, you can very quickly see um, radical changes um, in the performance of your campaign and the efficiency of your campaign by being able to step outside of... And take, um, a, take a kind of a, a full picture. Yeah of the overall campaign. So that, that I'm going to bring into suppose, the, the transparency that everyone's trying to, to get hold of. And, and that's the difficulty at the moment is, is, is that to give them that transparency. Yes. And a, a lot of the, the tools that are there, and there are a number of, of attribution tools that they can use, which will give them that transparency, but only after a certain look back window. Uh, so that that's something. But I know that there was a, um, some work you've done, uh, David, uh, with the Better Gyms, and you were going to just bring us through, just Tell us a little bit about Better Gyms and some of the challenges they had and when they came to us and uh, and, and how we went about uh, solving that problem for them. What, yes. was their, what was their pressure point? Yeah, I always believe it's it's easier to understand the math with a life example, something that's actually happened in real life for us. So Better Gyms, a customer we've been working with since January. The first challenge we encountered with them is they were achieving a CPA, which was around 1,000. It was very, very high, especially in comparison to other channels such as Google. So their overall CPA was it was a thousand euro on on one channel so, just for Facebook. Okay, all right. While the CPA for other channels, for example Google, it was a tenth of that. Wow. All right, so we're talking a very high. Difference. That's a very hard thing to stand up in front of your board and go, uh, look, um, yeah, we're still going to put the same budget into this yeah. channel and this channel. Yeah. So and, that, and, that yeah. was part of the problem they were encountering. Obviously, when they tried to justify that to the board, they said, please remove Facebook from your investment. It right. doesn't make sense. You're really throwing your money away. So first thing we did with them was just bring in our optimization platform, Bionic, and just work on what they had within Facebook uniquely. Okay. Only by doing that, we reduced already a CPA to 50% of that. 
And wow. we were in less than a month, we were already in around 500, 400 to 500 more mess. And we kept it there, improving slightly, but we were still working within Facebook metrics. This is just optimizing on using your, your skills, uh, your knowledge, and the, 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 the tool, the bionic tool. You were able to drive down by half their CPA. They must be delighted. Yeah, <laughs> it was a good job as well with Andrea, who was managing the account as well. We did a lot of work as well when it comes to actually uh, Facebook best practices, what we also call kind of bionic best practices based on our knowledge, both of the industry, the market, uh, but also the platform itself. Just by itself, when you give the right structure and you really implement these changes, the platform does marvelous things and it's practically, um, it reduces your workload by a lot because it's optimizing in real time, 24 hours a day, Every hour you got a big change and that really helps not to have to be on top of those results all the time and having to implement manual changes. But obviously we're still talking about 400, let's say CPA on average. Right. Considering still the 100 chunky, from yeah. Google, yeah. it's yeah. still quite a bad, yeah. you know. So even though we're talking now about June, obviously the board was saying, you know, we gave you six months, it's still not going good enough, you know, and they started removing budget. So what we suggested to them is nowadays you're measuring your results within Google campaign management. And that is where you have your attribution, and that is where you're measuring success of the campaign. So they used the Google Campaign Manager as their single source of truth exactly. in, in the campaign to, to allow them to, to try, I suppose, decipher that, that uh, picture and, and understand where these conversions were coming from. Is exactly. that right? Yeah, based on what Brendan was mentioning before, they were trying to look at those deduplicated values, try to be as accurate as they can and attributing those purchases to a specific channel. Right, so so they could see now using the Google campaign, they could see then their overall campaign, and and how did the how did the Bionic tool that help them? I mean, what did it do differently than than they could already see in their in their look back window? Yeah, so on top of the actual Bionic platform, we have a universal marketing bridge. What this tool helps you do is, on one hand, is bring what you have in DCM into Facebook, publish those campaigns, have your click trackers on, and be able to make that attribution easy. Um, and reducing a lot of workload when it comes to making the job. For everyone who's been there knows that if you have a lot of ads, a lot of ad sets, it's very difficult to be granular. It's a lot of click, click trackers, there's a lot of human error within budgets and the actual links that you're gonna put in your contents. So, so this allows them to, to, to set it up almost immediately. Yeah, we reduce around right. 14 hours of uh, work right. per month right. uh, for this kind of size of customer. So that's a lot of work and that's a lot of uh, time spent and obviously money that you invest on that person. So that was the first kind of success of the story. But the second part is that what we do is we also build the return time. So what we get is those metrics that appear in Google Campaign Manager, we bring them into Facebook. And now what we consider there is what Brendan was mentioning before on the map. Instead of optimizing your campaigns towards what Facebook is saying, if you're looking at Google Campaign Manager as your source of truth, let's use that to optimize your campaign. So, you're able, so you can take in then the real-time signals from um, from all of your activity on all of your your, your campaigns say across for example like YouTube or, or search or whatever and looking at those creatives as you've already matched up all the, the click trackers you're able to then optimize them in real time on those uh, different ad sets within your social campaign exactly so we'll only be considering those deduplicated values so well, those that have been attributed to Facebook based on the attribution model the customer had I see. And, and so that, that would have, um, so what, how did it impact their campaign? Well, those are the results you have actually on the slide. So just within the first two weeks, we achieved a 52% conversion rate, increase in conversion rate, which is, I think is very significant, especially within a two weeks period, and a 64% reduction on the cost per conversion. Wow. Obviously we're talking now that, okay, we're still not within the 100 that Google has, but now we're around 150. So we're close enough. Now you're justifying your spend on Facebook. There's always a likelihood that one of the channels will be a bit more expensive than another. But here comes the second part of the exercise. The customer was always looking at last click attribution model. Okay. As we did discuss before, it's kind of a bit obsolete. By itself, it's not bad, but you need to consider the other uh, attribution models as well, or uniquely consider a data-driven attribution model. Better Gyms was always reluctant to run brand awareness within Facebook. The reason behind it is because they didn't really understand what was the impact of Facebook in it. Once we started looking at first click attribution model and the side paths, they realized that around 80% of the conversions that were being attributed to Google on the last click attribution model actually started on Facebook. Uh, I see. So right. it was the most important channel they actually have for brand awareness. And nowadays they're spending around 50% of the budget they spend on Facebook, which had already increased by three times what they were spending before 
just on brand awareness. Right, so that, that's really helping them fill the top of the funnel then, and, and that obviously then works better for them overall. So that's how you, so is this a typical kind of performance that you would see with, with clients when you bring them onto the bridge? It is, it is a typical scenario, because at the end of the day, it happens more often than not, that that math we saw before, it's actually happened in Google Campaign Manager. The metrics really differ a lot from one place to the other, and the audiences that are performing better towards your attribution model tend to be different. That's not saying that the attribution that Facebook is showing is, is wrong. It is correct. Facebook had an impact on that conversion. It might not just be the impact you were thinking of within that journey. Very good. That's, that's fascinating. So it, that's, this is, um, I know this is a, a case study that uh, you've just released out into the market as well. So um, that is available, I, I think, on the, the website today. So you'll be able to download that if it you is. want any more information. But so this really comes on to my, my final point here is, is all about that real time. Because I mentioned that the look back window is you can look back and see the different channels and how they perform. And, and how important is this in real time to be able to make those changes? And you highlighted some of the points there in terms of what we did, you know, what you did with, with better gyms. Um, and I suppose this, you know, if, as we ever improve that, that, uh, that each of the different channels and we keep performing, we keep building the top of the pipe. So we need to understand in real time, I suppose, the, the, the value of each of those areas. How important is that for, um, for marketeers? in terms of attribution yeah I, I, so so typically you know the behavior that we, we we are used to is looking at our it's our google analytics or our attribution report at the end of a week or maybe at the end of a month um analyzing the data um making some decisions and then implementing changes right um and uh and there's quite a bit of work in that right and certainly as you have more platforms and you have more audiences and more campaigns kind of doing more things um, the way we describe it internally here is, is you know, um, you're doing that, you're looking back at historical data um, to make future decisions. So it's a bit like driving your car um, by looking in the rear view mirror. Right. Okay. Yeah. Where you, what you want to be doing is you want to be responding, you know, in as close to real time as possible to the changing market conditions. So we need to think about every each of these platforms is essentially an auction. It's a live marketplace where you're bidding to buy an ad or an audience um, that will deliver a particular result. And you're doing that between the platforms and across the platforms. So um, whether it's at the top of the funnel or right through the bottom of the funnel or remarketing to existing customers, um, you want to be getting the best value now um, in the current market conditions. So, you know, I guess the, ideally you want to be, and this is where automation comes in, um, analyzing the data in real time and making those decisions in real time and then actioning that in real time uh, yeah. yeah that makes quite a lot of sense actually you know if you think about i suppose the environment we're in now digital environment and how quickly uh, even content or conversations change it's important that you have the the correct sort of creatives that can optimize towards that you know so if a, a particular yes you know, i don't know i suppose you're going towards christmas and puppies are big then you know you start using more of your, your dog creative etc but i know but i think that the the sentiment then on these channels because they change so rapidly it's important that you have um, also your campaign that it can activate and change along with those um, that the market environment. Yeah, all, all data there is important. I mean, it's not like looking backwards to the data is not relevant. It is relevant to plan your future campaigns, to plan what's going to go on in the next month, look at what happened last December, to plan ahead for this December. You will understand better how it works and you will understand better some decisions you can make, especially regarding to targeting. But as Brendan was saying, when it comes to the day to day, you need real-time actions. You need to really make changes based on the actual behavior at that particular moment in time. It's not repeated from month to month, so you can't really be looking backwards towards what you're gonna do today. That's where Bionic comes in. But there's also the importance that most customers, let's be honest nowadays, especially with a smaller budgets, they tend to look at conversions. Mm -hmm. That's the only, the key point of their success is conversions, and they don't really care about the rest of the funnel. Yeah. Top-level funnel, awareness, consideration. It's not something they give importance to. Something I've been putting in practice with all my customers for the last year, where I always build a strategy and I consider all these steps on the funnel. Obviously, depending on the company, there'll be more or less steps within it. What we see is that, okay, in the short term, maybe your, your raw as your return on ad spend, it might reduce a bit because you are spending a part of your budget in awareness you weren't doing before. But within the midterm, your CPA tends to reduce a lot because what you're doing is you're building for the future. And especially, I believe that for smaller companies, when there is no brand recognition in the market, this is even more important. You need to let your name know. You need to show to people who yeah. you are. 
then you've got to try them to understand what are your USPs. If it's your people, show them who your people are, you know, where are you located, why you care about the environment nowadays is so trendy, you know. Mm. Um, you've got to really prove this to customers because you're nurturing them little by little yeah. by utilizing all these multiple platforms that they have there, all these channels until you finally get the conversion. Yeah. And you keep building for the future. And I, I've, I, you know, anecdotally, I've, I've heard that back from, um, from clients as well, you know, in terms of that, uh, that, that's a big challenge for them. If they really want to grow their business fast, they have to grow the entire pipeline, the entire funnel at the same time. If they focus on purely just driving the bottom or driving the top, they're, they're not nurturing the whole uh, sales funnel. And so it'll be a much slower growth path for them. So that's, that's really important. And, and thanks to me again for coming in today and chatting through that. Um, so just really, I'm wrapping up here, and um, we're just about a minute over. Uh, just some touch points, I suppose, some key takeaways is to, to look at the uh, data-led attribution models. Um, that's the only way forward. We've got to take the information from every different element, every type of creative across all the areas of the funnel to really fully understand um, how much and how, what value they have for your campaign. The cross-platform attributions are trying to break down those barriers between um, the, the, the large wall gardens and, and be able to um, decipher then the true value of each of those uh, placements in your campaign. And then in real time, the automated optimization of your campaigns so that you're really delivering a performance uh, and a growth performance for the long term. So thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, again, I'm uh, Ronan Turner. Brendan in, Brendan Hughes in uh, from Bionic and David Guterres uh, from Bionic. So we're happy to hear from you. If you can drop us any uh, questions that you might have, uh, we are bionic.com. Uh, there'll be another webinar on in January and we'll give you some notice about that. If you want to, um, as I said, if you have any questions, just drop us an email or, or get in touch on our site. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.